They're, they'll be taking, they'll be taking your pictures. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's bring it back to. Okay. So today we are going. It's a nice. It's a, certainly a nice day, but it's nice to see so many people show up. Okay. Uh, we have, and so we will try to move this along. We have a busy, busy schedule. Um, we have uh, at least three guest speakers today. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Louise Jenkins, from uh, who is the stroke coordinator from uh, South uh, from Peace South Southwest, uh, and Dr. Martin Gizzi, who is the overall stroke director for uh, Legacy System, and uh, the stroke coordinator Christy Iden Item. Uh, from uh, Legacy Salmon Creek. So obviously the subject today is stroke. Uh, we're going to have a couple of uh, different presentations, and but then some information from both stroke programs. Now, Dr. Cerise um, Bassin was to be here, but she's in the middle of uh, the ICU right now, taking care of a stroke patient at uh, Southwest. So. The order of this today is uh, we'll have uh, Louise speak first and then go on to the legacy program. If you want to. You want to yeah. yeah. Okay. Good morning. I understand that I'm trapped right here. I can't leave out of this area, so I'm going to try and use this one. If I wander off, they'll yell at me, I'm sure. How are you? Um, I have to say, listening to Mark talk about the sobering unit and that serve ban, the first thing that popped into my mind was a Stephen King novel. You know, I, just uh, kind of a weird sense of humor there, I guess. So my name is Louise Jenkins. Like uh, Dr. Whitworth said, uh, Dr. Bassin is our only neurohospitalist on duty today, and so she is in the ICU with a couple of patients. So I got elected to be here. We put together this presentation before I went on vacation two weeks ago, and it's the last time I've seen it. So this is going to be a first review back of it. So the objectives of today are we're going to review the head and neck vasculature uh, because primarily I'm going to be looking at uh, the large vessel occlusion, uh, the research about it, the identification and treatment of the large vessel occlusions. We're going to talk about the Pulsera communication tool. Have you all heard of the Pulsera communication tool that's coming like, next week? Okay, well we're gonna show some demos of it and talk about it and answer some questions for you. Uh, then we're gonna talk about our 2016 data uh, of our patients, our EMS involvement and the outcomes. So y'all know about stroke. Um, we're number one when it comes to long-term disability in the United States, number five cause of death. So you're much more likely to survive and then be taken over by a complication later on. Almost 800,000 a year happen um, and um, kills about 128,000 people. It's very significant. Um, it has a significant financial impact in the United States, and it's not just the patient, not just the family. That extends to the community, to the population at large, because um, when, it, when our tax dollars are put towards this, it affects the community. So uh, it's a very expensive disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about that almost 800,000 strokes in the United States, and about 87% are ischemic strokes. You know, the blockage of the artery for some reason. If it's a plaque rupture, if it's a thrombus, if it's an embolus, that vessel is intact, but it's clogged. So the, by far the majority is ischemic. And then about 13% are the hemorrhagic version, where an aneurysm uh, leaks or ruptures, or the AVM, the single cellular vessels, all wind up and, and occlude. So I'm going to focus on this 87 percent, the large majority of the ischemic of these strokes. How do we take care of these strokes, the medical management? Well, you all are familiar with IV TPA, the very, very strong clot-busting drug. It was uh, approved by the FDA in 1995. And actually, I believe it was August or September of 1995. I remember that well because I had a cerebellar stroke in February of 1995 and was not offered to TPA. Patients have to be in a certain time window to receive TPA, IV, well, for all of the interventions actually, but the time window for IV TPA is zero to three hours is what the FDA approves. So, and the zero being the time the patient was last normal 
it's sometimes called the last normal, the last well, but it's the, when did their symptoms start? So that's your job. One of your big jobs in the field is to find out when the symptoms started. You have to be an investigator sometimes. You know, people don't know what time this started, but what was on TV, what were you doing? People are pretty much in a pattern, so you get to be the investigator there. In Europe, they have approved the extension from three to four and a half hours for IV TPA for a select group of patients that have to meet uh, more strict criteria, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and then there are other contraindications that would uh, preclude a patient from being offered TPA, the IV TPA, if they come within the zero to four and a half hours to the ER. And that is uh, at the discretion of the neurologist. And in fact, IV TPA is the gold standard expectation in an ischemic stroke, and our physicians have to document why it is not offered. Uh, litigation right now is higher on the side of why a person was not offered TPA as opposed to getting TPA and having a, a complication from it. So then the new, the new arena is uh, not new. This actually came out like around 2004. Uh, Southwest was one of the uh, uh, clinical trial sites for the Mercy Retriever, I think in 2003, 2004, the mechanical thrombectomy. And the mechanical thrombectomy is when uh, a, we take the patient to the cath lab and uh, just like having a cardiac procedure, a cardiac stent put in, we go through the groin, thread it up into the brain, and retrieve that clot in, in a different way and actually manually pull it out back through the groin. Uh, the time window for a thrombectomy is up to eight hours from when symptoms started. So that you can see that almost doubles the opportunity of acute treatment for a patient. Um, if the patient fails IV TPA um, or they're ineligible for IV TPA for whatever reason, maybe they're past the four and a half hours but not up to eight, they can qualify for the uh, mechanical uh, thrombectomy. And we're going to get into all these contraindications and indications later. Not everybody qualifies. That's one important thing that I want you to understand. Your job is to get them there on time and then the docs will decide if they qualify. I just want to do a little quick uh, recap of the vasculature of the head and the neck. I'm sure you all just love talking about all this stuff. I remember being in nursing school and thinking, holy cow, who cares about all those things up there? But they are important. Because you truly only have four vessels that carry the blood to your brain. Your brain is your master computer. Uh, for years, the American Heart Association said, oh, your, your heart is your main pump. It's your main pump, but without your brain telling your heart to pump, it isn't going to happen. So your brain is your master computer for everything. And the four vessels that you have that supply your brain are your two carotids and your two verts that go up the back of your neck. That's it. That's, so if the person has an injury or an occlusion in one of their vessels, they've lost 25% of the blood flow to that area that's served. So you have two parts of your brain looking at it uh, top and bottom. The anterior is, you know, your frontal lobe, your parietal, your temporal, and uh, the top part of your occipital here. That's about 80% of your brain. That is served by your carotids. Do you have a pointer? Is there a pointer? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I guess I can't go show. Oh. The Okay, I can point at the screen here. So these two that come up, they, they come up and they go on in here and they intersect into the circle of Willis. You all familiar with the circle of Willis, the little circle in the middle, and that's where the blood goes out into the periphery, into the brain. The mid-cerebral artery, artery being the largest one. So the carotid's about 80%, the anterior. The verts, the vertebrals that come up the back, join into the basilar that go up into the circle of Willis, and it serves about the other 20%, which is your cerebellum and the lower part of your, okay. It's a red dot in the center. I don't see a red dot. That's a line. Oh, red line. Oh, look at that. We, we have, okay. So for that, can I go in front of this? Yes. Okay. So, right, where the heck is it? I think it died. Anyway, can I talk loud? No, I can't walk around. Okay. Anyway, front of the brain, back of the brain. Um, 
and they all feed into the circle of Willis, which feeds it out through the mid-cerebral arteries to all the periphery of the brain. So if you have that occlusion somewhere in that mid-cerebral artery, it's not just that area that's affected. Everything beyond it that that feeds from is affected in that stroke. Let's talk about thrombectomies, sometimes called embolectomy. It kind of depends on the reason for that occlusion there. The thrombectomy happens there, the embolectomy, the em embolus comes from somewhere else, maybe uh, from a heart that doesn't beat regular uh, and a clot that's thrown off and, and migrates up there. So they don't have a point. So as you can see where the diamond is, that those two coming up, that's your verts, that's your basilar artery, that circle is the, as if they can see me here, the circle of Willis, that's your posterior brain. The two that look like hip bones, coming up, I guess I kind of like hip bones, yeah. Um, those are the internal carotids that feed into that circle of Willis, and then the two large ones out are the mid-cerebral arteries. That's where the large vessels occlusions occur, right in this circle where these arrows and this diamond are, where we're able to take these people to the cath lab, thread this um, stent retriever up into the brain and remove the clot. So uh, we cannot go out past uh, probably the second portion, maybe a little bit into third of the mid-cerebral artery, but beyond that, it's very, it's just physically not able to be reached, so. But by opening these large vessels is really going to reduce the disability and, the, and improve the outcomes. New battery. New battery, all right, really good. All right. It's another 20 well, now that I'm off, okay. So which patients would be the patients for lar with a large vessel occlusion? So our, a patient who receives IV TPA, IV TPA is the gold standard for ischemic stroke treatment. A patient should always get IV TPA if they're eligible and, uh, and have that opportunity to get the IV TPA. So, but if they receive IV TPA and it does not respond uh, well, they could be a, throm a thrombectomy a, a candidate. And um, successful opening of occlusion by IV TPA alone, that mid-cerebral artery, that big artery that feeds a large portion, the, feeds that whole side of the brain, is about 35%. So uh, having the uh, thrombectomy option is a good option for the patient. The scope of the problem is that about 40 to 50 percent of patients, uh, ischemic strokes, are, occur in the mid-cerebral artery. These patients have a five times higher risk of mortality, maybe not initially, but those complications really add up, and a threefold reduction in a good outcome. We're going to talk about how outcomes are, are measured. We have standardized uh, ways of measuring the blood flow that comes back as well as outcomes. Um, and then the patients, like I said, that respond poorly to IV TPA. Uh, we have started uh, in, at Southwest, if a patient gets IV TPA and there is not almost an immediate uh, response, some improvement, uh, getting that cath lab t ready. You know, they're, they're alerted uh, already that we have the stroke patient, a possible candidate, and they're mobilized early. And so uh, successful reopening of the artery is associated with improved outcome, and that just makes sense. When, a, when the vessel's occluded, brain cells are going to die, and they die at a rate of almost 2 million a minute. As you can see, oh, let's see if this works. Okay, this is the, uh, the vessel coming up, and you can see right here, there's, there's no vasculature over here. The, this is the stent retriever. Uh, we're going to look at a video in a little bit. Where gone up and they've pulled, they've removed it out, and then immediately they, the docs can see the vasculature that opens up. Now these patients have risk. There is risk involved in this. One is vessel rupture. Another is a reperfusion uh, hemorrhage. Uh, this part of the brain has been without blood flow for who knows, you know, if it was two hours until the IV TPA and then maybe another 45 minutes until the cath lab was ready, so almost three hours without vasculature flow, and then all of a sudden it's like a garden hose when you unkink it and that flow is established back at the rate it was, they're at risk for hemorrhage. So we have to do very close monitoring uh, after this procedure for at least 24 hours. Oh, it's not that one. You get me confused with all this stuff to use here. Okay. 
Okay, so I said about 2 million brain cells die every minute with an ischemic stroke, and that's true, 1.9 million neurons. And the brain, brain ears, the normal, the average ischemic stroke evolves for about 10 hours. And it evolves until the body says, oh, well, I'm done. You know, it's a nice little encapsulated, not little, but it's, a, it's an encapsulated uh, dead tissue in the person's brain. And they will lose about 36 years of brain tissue uh, life um, and have that disability. So that's why time is of such importance when you think this person may be having a stroke, assessing them and getting them to a stroke center. Let's look at the outcomes here. So the probability of a good clinical outcome over time is related to the angiographic reperfusion. And we don't do this blindly in the cath lab. The, pa the patient has to have imaging that shows exactly where that clot is. And the, the neurointerventionalists don't go in there blindly and just try to find it. They'll do a CTA and they'll follow it on a, a screen that's probably almost twice as big as that and, and go up and retrieve and get to this clot and retrieve it and pull it out. And then immediately they have to do what's called a Tiki score. And that's going to be on, the, I think, the next slide, saying how much reperfusion they get initially. And the greater the reperfusion, the greater the outcome for the patient. And as you can see here, it is time dependent also. So the um, the perpendicular line is the probability of a good outcome. The horizontal line is the minutes from onset, or last known well, last known normal time. And as you can see, it starts up about a 0.9% of a good outcome, and it's slow, and it, it drops off when you get up to double that. To, uh, 200, 200 minutes is about three hours, a little over three hours from um, onset. So that's the person that has come in and maybe gotten IV TPA. And then the longer we wait, the worse the outcome potential for them is. There's a lot of good data that talks about um, the benefit of having thrombectomy and bolectomy uh, with or without IV TPA. And this came uh, out in 2015. The American Heart, American Stroke Association compiled this um, uh, this article, Focused Update uh, Guidelines for the Early Management of Patients with Acute Ischemic Stroke regarding the endovascular treatment. Up until then, it was, um, it was a neurologist thinking about it. And, and I know at our institution, we have some neurologists that are gung-ho on, oh, the, the IV TPA is not working. Let's get that cath lab involved. And others that are like, well, I just don't know. You know, so it was kind of, it kind of varied. Well, now it's more standardized. After this article came out and it looked at all of these clinical trials, Mr. Clean, Extend A, Escape, Revask, and Swift Prime, all of these had very good data showing that the outcome of patients that were able to have a, the mechanical thrombectomy had improved outcomes. So there was no denying it, but there had to be a certain strict set of criteria uh, a certain selection process and standardized. That was the that was the thing that we we had to come up with for our neuros. Um, we had to assure that there were faster times of door to needle, door to puncture, and we have we have reduced ours dramatically already. We have to have careful selection, just like with IV TPA. We have to look at, with IV TPA, they say, when was, have they had a recent head trauma? Have they had recent surgery? What is their lab work? Uh, you know, there's a whole criteria that the neuro has to look at and, and say this patient is or isn't uh, eligible. Same thing for the thrombectomy. That's when the neurointerventionalist gets in and says, oh, we look at their age, we look at their uh, modified Rankin scale pre, we look at their uh, National Institute of Health stroke scale. I'll go into all that in a little bit. So we are very strict about who is selected to go into this population. Uh, and every month there's more and more and more. I can remember some months we had one, some months we had none. Now most months I have at least three. Last month, which I didn't do the data yet because I was on vacation, um, I, think, I think I had five. So it's just, I think it's really, people are becoming uh, used to it and uh, offering it more when the patient is appropriate. So the patient selection, how do we decide that? Well, if IV TPA is, first of all, the gold standard is given within the three to four and a half hours, uh, zero to four and a half hours, depending on which 
a set of the patients they fall into. Um, the endovascular therapy, generally we offer up until eight hours from when the symptoms started. Um, our neurointerventionalists, I have seen them when it's a posterior stroke, go up to 12 hours, even 14 a couple of times. Um, but our gold standard is eight, is what we, we tell our ED docs. Um, and then they, they get the neurointerventionalists involved, and then it's up to them if they need to ex want to extend it. Usually 80 years or less is the um, age limit, let's say. But that is a suggested number. Um, and that is because over 80, you know, people might look really well on the outside, but they're still 80 years old on the inside. Um, that being said, last month we did an endovascular on a 94-year-old man who was riding his bicycle, um, completely independent, living alone, having a really good life. We did a thrombectomy, and he went home the next day. He's back playing golf and riding his bicycle. So it's all an individual decision. But 80 is the what we we use as our criteria, which can always be bent. The severity of the stroke, of the symptoms that that person is showing, usually the NIHSS, National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, needs to be eight or higher. So how do, are y'all familiar with the NIH? It's a huge, huge scale. Uh, it's a test that is 11 steps long. Uh, ED docs do it, the nurses do it, and it, it sets a common ground to say, this is that patient's deficit and this is how severe it is. It's a great, great tool. It looks at all of your cranial nerves except one. And I saw everybody's eyelids drop when I said cranial nerves. Oh my God. But without your cranial nerves working, nothing works. That's what controls. Right, rather. So, um, the NIH is, a, is an 11-step test, and each step is it's, it's clearly defined how to test it. And eight is a, is a moderate stroke. You know, zero to six in there is, is a, or zero to four is small, four to eight is a moderate, and above eight is a more severe stroke. And it goes to 42, and it's like golf. The lower the score, the better. So eight is pretty significant, but when that large vessel is what's occluded, you're going to see a large deficit, a larger deficit. Usually the pre-stroke modified Rankin score is zero to one. The modified Rankin score is a way that we look at patients, uh, what is, your, is their level of independence? Zero is I'm totally independent. You know, I can take my meds, I can drive myself, I can cook, I can do everything. Y'all are zeros, I'm sure. Maybe not you, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and so the higher the score on the modified Rankin, the more uh, dependent people are for their activities of daily living. So pre-stroke, they like to talk to the family and say, what could he do before? What could he not do? So zero to one, these people are pretty darn self-sufficient. So we look at that, how severe is what they're having now. And then the imaging-based selection, CTA, MRA, documenting the clot in the right area, in that circle that I showed you with the arrows and the diamond, needs to be, we need to see the clot there and know exactly where we're going uh, and get there fast. Salvageable tissue, penumbra imaging or collateral imaging. Um, you know, when, when a person has a stroke, and this is the vessel, nice color here, that's the clot, you've got right away, the tissue starts dying right here. But there is this area around called the penumbra, and that's what's at risk of dying if that clot doesn't get open, if that vessel doesn't get open. So um, the imaging will show how big of the, the tissue, the dead is there, and the, the tissue at risk uh, by doing the diffusion weight imaging, uh, the, the, what we can save. So we look at how much is dead, how much is at risk, and, and it needs to be in a certain proportion for the physician to make the determination. Um, and then a small established core by the imaging, so the part that's already dead can't be that big. So, And then, like I said, we need to have a rapid endovascular workflow. We need to have short door-to-needle times for IV. We need to get the cath lab involved early. We need to... Um, so we can get the groin puncture and get that uh, retriever up into the brain as fast as possible. And we've made some big strides. We still have strides, uh, hurdles to jump over. And then we need to document the Tiki score. You know, how much perfusion was uh, opened 
as soon as that uh, clot was, was uh, moved out of the way. So we can watch for improvement there. Here's the TIKI, okay. Stands for thrombolysis and cerebral infarction. So a grade zero means there is no reperfusion. They have tried to do a, uh, and sometimes they get in there and they can't get past whatever is there or for, for a reason, they get up to the clot, oh, wrong one, and can't get past it. So no perfusion is obtained. Uh, a grade one, it is past the initial obstruction, but little is there. See, right, what's open there? Not much. You get to the, the two uh, into this segment, it's less than half the diameter of the vessel is open. There's two A here. So they've opened it up, and you see a little more vasculature. Two B, even more, it's greater than half is open. This is backwards, I think. And then three, there's full perfusion, because you can see how the whole area, the whole side of that brain is reperfused. Uh, so you, that's the, the scores. So that uh, has to be documented by the interventionalist at the end of their endovascular procedure so we can watch. And uh, like I said before, uh, the person that gets the more, the more reperfusion is good for them because they're getting the blood to the parts they need, but then we have to watch them very closely for the post-procedure hemorrhage. The modified Rankin score um, that I talked about, this is the, the standardized way that we measure uh, the person's independence. And uh, we do this with the family or with the patient even in the ED when they come in and we talk about what, the, what, the, what they can do and what they can't do and we can figure out a modified Rankin pre-stroke. Uh, with the family or whoever we're talking to. This is also the scale that our therapists use uh, when they're getting ready to go to maybe rehab or they need to go to a sniff first and get their um, uh, stamina built up before they go to rehab or, or whatever. And then this is the score I call all of our intervention patients about 90 days after they go home. And we do this over the phone. So it's a very, I like the scale. I don't have to run out and see them or anything. And uh, this is how we uh, gauge are they still maintaining their level of independence? And most of the time they are improving. So the patients uh, post-stroke who are really dedicated and they do what they're told and they do their exercises and they take their medications uh, tend to, to have, have the lowest scores on this, which is good. You know how it is about getting people to follow directions. Okay. So randomized clinical trial. Uh, on this one, the orange is the control group, the, the patients that did not have uh, uh, endovascular procedure, they did have IV TPA, and the green are the patients that had either just thrombectomy or a combo, had IV TPA, and then uh, the thrombectomy. And as you can see, in all instances, uh, the patients had a better outcome at 90 days um, when they had either the thrombectomy alone or in combination. And this slide was really what I took to our neurologist and said, look at this. And we talked about each trial individual. And that's what kind of sparked them to say, you know, I think I can do this and, and I think it's good for the patients. So uh, getting them on board was, was half of my battle. Um, and actually, uh, uh, one of these trials, I can't remember, can you remember which trial was uh, stopped early because of the success rate? Was, wasn't it, was the extend IA? Yeah, they were, they were stopped early because of the great outcomes. They didn't even finish the trial. So that alone is, is good to say, you know, that's good for the patient that they have this opportunity and it's uh, right here for us. So let's look at the number needed to treat. What that means is how many people need to receive that whatever to have one success. So aspirin after stroke, you know, you, they have to be on an uh, anti-platelet. Uh, uh, so 100 people need to be treated to show a success. Thrombolytics for MI, 43 people need to be treated to show a success. Coumadin for atrial fib, you know, everybody with AFib, well now those NOACs are out, you know, the river roxaban and the, all of those. Um, but this was the, the Coumadin for AFib, 25 needed to be treated to have a benefit. For the IV TPA for stroke, only eight people, so the lower the number, the better. You treat less and you have a success. But for mechanical thrombectomy for stroke, three needed to be treated to show a success. So you can see here how, this, how important this is. It falls in the needed to treat. You treat less and you have more success. 
Okay. Where's my video? Can I say something about the Hibernian retreat? Go for it. The sensitive issue. Yeah. So the fact that you need to treat, let's my say, my video is gone. Trying to get this to work. Let's see. Where's Mark? Good question. Good question. Because I, yeah, I can't get it to play. Well, I'll go on and he can come back and show this. Oh, I can't get it to show when it's open. Uh, right here. See? There, see? There's nothing to click on, is there? No. Maybe just in the middle? Mm. Mm. That's going on. Well, we can go back. Well, when Mark comes back, we'll see if he can play that. It was a video showing the, the endovascular procedures, taking it up there. And it really wasn't real re realistic because the uh, vessels were squeaky clean and nice and curved. They're nowhere like that in real life. You're going the wrong way. It's going forward, yeah. Yeah. Put me to do it. There. There you go. There. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay. We'll see if we can show it. So here is a picture of uh, of a revascularization. Um, on the right is the. Uh, you can see there's no perfusion, reperfusion distally, and on the left is after that little box, it was kind of cloudy, but uh, that's where, that's the clot that they removed, and you can see the revascularization immediate, the immediate return uh, to that area. These are some of the clots retrieved. I'm glad nobody's eating in here because it's really kind of nasty, uh, that have been retrieved out. Um, let's see. I was real impressed with this one. This was an internal carotid, so that had to be really long. I, and they got the basket up to the uh, distal end and, and got that. It was quite impressive. This little gizmo right here was the very first endovascular uh, catheter called the Mercy Retriever, also called the corkscrew. And it's kind of hard to see, but it is like a corkscrew there with a point there. And they would s screw it, put it into the clot, and then pull it out. And the, the problem that happened there was pieces would break off and go distally, and, and the, what I was told was that, well, little pieces that go distally would have a lesser effect for that patient than having the large vessel occluded. But now, by using this retriever, when, if we see that video, you'll see that this is threaded uh, through the introducer, through the um, uh, clot, then the introducer is taken out, and it is expanded, just like opening a, a vessel in the heart. They do this in the brain, and it right away it opens up uh, a path for blood to go through, and it becomes embedded in the into the clot, and and then they just pull it out. Uh, they block off the blood so it's not flowing past it, and uh, and agitating, and they do little pieces at a time, and then they'll open up the balloon, and it doesn't happen like this. the The standard cath lab is anywhere from. 30 to 90 minutes, and it's all manual. The interventionalist is there and pulling manually uh, and stopping and holding, so it's, it's really uh, interesting. And the one thing I did say to Dr. Shano, I was in the cath lab with him once, and I said, uh, so did you play video games as a child? And he said, I still do. And so it, that's what it reminded me of. They're watching it all up there, and it's, it's really cosmic, I have to tell you. So, and I want you to remember, some patients do go to the cath lab without IVTPA. The majority of ours have had IVTPA first. This is also uh, the, the method that we use most for in-house strokes, patients that are there for something else, uh, gallbladder or, or knee replacement, whatever, and they have a stroke in-house. Um, because people that are there for a reason are already sick, so the chances are they're not going to qualify for IVTPA. Uh, particularly if they've just had surgery on something, so uh, it's this uh, how we work uh, primarily for our in-house strokes. So this is the guideline I talked about that came out in 2015 uh, talking about thrombectomy. It is available um, in the American Heart, American Association um, 
journal. And if you ever just need something to put you to sleep at night, pull that up and read it. It will. Be, it will. Some of the key points for the endovascular therapy are patients who are eligible for IV TPA should receive IV TPA. That cannot be stressed enough that if they're within that zero to three, zero to four and a half hours, they should receive IV TPA first. The endovascular can be added on. If they're past that three to four and a half, but still within eight, absolutely, they need, we'll look at that endovascular first. That's the, the gold standard, like I said, is IV. And the litigation, like let me stress, is much higher when patients are not offered the IV TPA. And it's clearly documented why they didn't get it. Yes? For, uh, yeah. Probably just one time for that to, yeah. So, uh, yeah. You, you, you should not do it if yeah. you've had a TPA administration within the last uh, three months. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beyond that, you can get the mm -hmm. drug. Yeah. We've had a repeat, but it's, it was like two years. Yeah. Uh, patients should receive the endovascular therapy with the stent retriever if they meet the criteria. So the very strict criteria is that modified Rankin score, pre-stroke needs to be zero to one. They need to be really independent uh, to begin with. If a patient comes in and they live in a facility, a dementia facility, uh, uh, and they require uh, assistance with their daily living, they can't take their meds or cook or whatever, that patient will not go to uh, cath lab, uh, might not even get the IV TPA because what we do then is not going to cure their pre-existing condition. It's not going to cure the dementia. They're going to go to the same level of care that they had and the risks of the TPA alone are bleeding and then you get the risk of the endovascular on there and that's where the neurologist has to outweigh, has to you know, weigh the, the risk versus benefit. So, and that's sometimes hard to explain to family. Um, causative occlu occlusion of the internal carotid artery. Uh, we need to see where it's, where it's at. Um, 18, we don't, uh, anybody under 18, uh, we ship to Portland. Actually, we did a 17-year-old that had an occlusion, but uh, a thrombectomy on that, on that person because it was very, he was at the very end of the time window and he did well. But 18 is uh, the, uh, you have, they have to be an adult. The NIHSS, as this says, of six. And this was from, uh, let's see if I remember this, the 2013 guidelines. Um, the other ones said eight. Aspects of uh, equal to or greater than six. And treatment can be initiated within s six hours of symptom onset. We use eight. I think that's the 15 guideline. This is the 13. So let's talk about signs. You know, the sudden signs, the sudden weakness, the sudden speech, the sudden uh, vision and all that. That's, that's the stroke in general signs. Let's talk about um, a little bit about left and right. You know, I talked about anterior and posterior already, 80 and 20. I'm going to talk about hemispheres, left and right, 50-50 or about. So uh, the left hemisphere, you know, controls the right side of the body. Um, Patients who have a left hemisphere stroke can show speech impairment. They can be mute. They can have lack of comprehension called receptive aphasia. And I have to say back in 2004 when I first started in stroke here, there were instances where patients were arrested and thought to be belligerent or uncooperative, because, but it was actually receptive aphasia. And the one instance, I was an ED nurse at that time, bless you, uh, was uh, the patient was on mill plane and sitting on the, the curb and just kind of rocking. And the police got there and, and they went up to him and they touched this man and he had no idea who they were, what they wanted. All he knew was that there were men touching him and he was, you know, batting them off. He had no idea what was going on. And so it was EMS who got there that said, now wait a minute, we need to look at this man. He came to the hospital and he did have a stroke and he had receptive aphasia. Uh, today that doesn't happen. Everybody uh, I think is very, very good at picking up um, belligerent versus aphasia. At at the patient is always given the uh, benefit in that instance. Uh, they can have a left gaze, look towards the left. 
uh, right facial droop and they can have a right-sided weakness with the left stroke. With the right hemisphere, uh, slurred speech, uh, expressive aphasia, and sometimes it's so slurred you have no idea what they're saying. Sometimes it just sounds like they're a little bit intoxicated. They'll have right gaze. They'll look so towards the side of the stroke. They'll have left facial droop, left-sided weakness, and left side neglect. They might not realize what's over here. Left side neglect, they just, it doesn't exist. And then there's the brain stem. You know the brain stem back here under the cerebellum? That is where all of your life functions live. Your breathing, your uh, heartbeat, uh, everything lives in your brain stem. So, and people can have abnormal eye movements, that's from the occipital lobe that's in there, nausea, vomiting, or vertigo. And let me tell you, this is what I had. And I had to lay down on the floor just to touch the floor because I didn't know where the floor was. So these people that have a sudden <laughs> onset of vertigo and the room spinning think cerebellar stroke. It is not good. Uh, difficulty speaking. Uh, decreased consciousness and there's something called cross signs I've never seen this I don't know if you've ever seen it where they have a droop on one side and then they have a sensory uh, deficit on the other so have you guys seen that many, times. many? Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen that one so I thought that was interesting um, with a brainstem no. this is the triage tool here in Washington I'm not going to go in depth on this but this I got from dr. Whitwer and uh, so you do the fast and, and then the stroke severity and based on that you determine where to take a patient and remember IVTPA should be the first goal um, and I noticed on the copy I have here it says up to six hours and we talked a while ago have you updated it to eight the summer, the summer. okay so right now you're working on the six hours for thrombectomy it's going to go up to eight this summer it's almost summer okay so the uh, emergent large vessel occlusion is a medical emergency. Uh, up to about 50% of strokes, uh, ischemic strokes, are large vessel. Um, it will affect the upper extremity, usually, uh, more than the lower extremity. The most common presenting symptoms of the large vessel occlusion, emergent large vessel occlusion. Uh, so I've put these up here with anterior and posterior, and it's the same symptom across. As you can see, hemiparesis, sensory, dysarthria, and, and visual are the most often presenting symptoms of the large vessel occlusion and the percentage of the strokes that they occur in. And, um, oh, I thought you were testing yourself. <laughs> You have, okay. There you go. Okay. So um, the hemiparesis is a very big uh, uh, indicator of a large vessel and, um, uh, let's see, the sensory deficit and the dysarthria. The dysarthria is the speech and the swallowing. So I don't ever give these people anything to drink, anything orally at all. Even if, it, if any stroke symptom, don't give them anything because of the risk of uh, uh, aspiration. I want to talk to you about Pulsera. Pulsera is a uh, communication tool. Uh, I'm sure some of you have gotten seen the vi to seen the video and uh, what's coming. We're going to be this is go live is next Tuesday, so all of our patients at Peace Health will be coming in by using Pulsera. It, you have iPhones for every ambulance, and I think, did you guys, you set it up so the, the ambulance is the identifier. Yeah, so you won't have individual accounts, so you will be using the, the iPhone, there, and they're pink. Aren't you happy? Um, it is uh, based on the information that the provider needs to make a medical determination for treatment. So, um, you know, when we get the HEAR report, and it's staticky or it's, it's uh, choppy and things get dropped off, uh, we might, it's not uncommon to miss information that really needs to be known. Well, with Pulsera, what is needed to be known is in the program. It's all right there. It is standardized what needs to be communicated. Uh, we're, we'll talk about these other features. Um, it is proven to reduce the door to treatment time by 10 to 40%. Um, it puts everybody on one platform, and let me tell you, uh, as the EMS who initiates the uh, stroke codes, the STEMI codes, or the, the general patient in, you will know every step 
of that patient's treatment, acute treatment, uh, for the STEMI and stroke, the ones that go on beyond the front door. Now, the general patient will stop when the patient gets to the ED. But you will know when the neurologist is there, when they've had their CT, when they've had their CTA, when their thrombolytics are given. And at the end of the case, you'll receive a summary. And you can look at that and see exactly what happened to that patient, what they got, what they didn't get, and why. There, should, there would be no questions unanswered. And if there are, you can always contact me. I'm moving back to the ED this week. I have to move, so I'll be uh, around the ED a lot more. Um, miscommunication, dropped communication, uh, misinterpreted communication is the number one cause of um, patient harm. So this hopefully moves us beyond that. Oh, I want to go back to the video here. Let's see if he's working out here. Oh, okay. This is the uh, STEMI patient. We're going to look at a STEMI patient here. Mm -hmm. Interested in seeing how the stop stroke module actually works? Great. Stop stroke standardizes the communication no matter where the patient is currently located in your system. As an example, let's look at an EMS activated case. A medic quickly starts a new case by tapping new on the home screen. Then they tap on the stroke module, select their destination facility, and enter their at patient and scene departure times. Distance and ETA are auto calculated using GPS. The medic enters the patient name and a few quick yet vital other pieces of information. It's easy to add an image. For example, a picture of the patient, a medication list, or driver's license. They simply tap a button and take a picture. The medic enters the last known well, pre-hospital stroke score, such as race, and critical lab values, like the blood glucose. That's it. With another tap, the hospital is immediately notified. In addition, EMS is updated when the hospital acknowledges the new inbound case. The hospital is then able to see critical information about the patient, including the last known well time. At this time, if the hospital wishes to activate their stroke system, they tap Activate. All on-call team members and all assigned physicians are simultaneously notified. In the team section, members can see a summary of every person associated with the case, alerts they have acknowledged, and with a single tap, they can call them directly from within the app. The stop stroke module is divided up into logical window panes. The next two window panes are for the emergency department and the radiology department. The ED can instantly update the team that the patient has arrived by entering the door time. Likewise, once the NIHSS score is completed, everyone is notified. When the CT or CTA is online, the radiology tech notifies everyone it's available for review. Using customizable templates, Anybody can quickly add a message for the entire team with a couple of taps. Key metrics like door to the NIHSS time and CT online are automatically captured. In addition, the bar timers provide visual clues for each department regarding where they are in their current case with respect to their facility averages and identified benchmarks. And of course, the ever-present universal clock keeps everybody synced. Contraindications to giving thrombolytics are readily available to all team members, keeping everyone on the same page and patient safety a top priority. The case does not stop when thrombolytics are given because this patient has a suspected LVO. The interventionalist can be assigned to the case and the IR team can be activated at any time with a simple tap. When the IR lab is ready to receive the patient, they can easily notify the entire team. Key metrics such as puncture, device first pass, and reperfusion can be captured. To stop a case, simply tap stop stroke and confirm your key therapeutic treatments. Everybody, including EMS, is immediately notified. Not only that, but now everybody can see a summary of their patient's outcome, providing immediate feedback for future improvement. For more training videos and updates, visit Pulsera.com. You will, since you're being the one, but will be the one that initiates these, you will receive all these alerts. You can turn off the alerts after your part is done for that single patient. You cannot turn off alerts for all the patients while you're on duty. And to, when you're off duty, well, you won't have it on your personal device, but those of you that do, you need to take yourself off call or you're going to get every one of them. Trust me, I know. So you can, uh, we'll show you where you can uh, turn it off for that patient. Unless you want to know all these. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And that bloop, bloop, bloop. Yeah. Uh, let's go to, let's see. I don't want that one. Uh, how, how is this HIPAA compliant? Yes. Oh. HIPAA compliant because Where is it? everything's in the cloud. Nothing resides on Where your device. And, Nothing. and it's gone the next day anyway. Uh -huh. You get the notification, and then it goes away. This will live on the device for uh, 40, uh, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the case, you can use the phone and go back to that patient and do your charting. All the times are logged in there. It's just a matter of the only thing you have to enter is something in the patient name. And you can just put initials and then take a picture of driver's license or something like that. All these pictures, everything is cloud-based. Nothing lives on the phone there. Nothing lives on our, app, our tablets in the ED. Um, so this, uh, STEMI is the easier one. I should have started with that one. Yes? Don't do that one? Okay. All right, we'll do STEMI. There we go. It's very easy. All right. Um, well, get out of here. I don't want to go over there. Just get out of here. Yes. Yes. It is. I'm not going to show that one either. Real quick. I got two slides. Yeah. Yeah. Real quickly, I just want to tell you about our 2016 data. Um, as you can see here, our door to needle is, is going down. Uh, Going down, we've done a couple of rapid process improvements um, in uh, 2015 and then just last November. And it, we're down to about 47 minutes uh, for our door to needle for our IV TPA. And our, uh, for our certification, we have to have 75% of our patients have to receive it within 60 minutes. We don't even fool around with 60 minutes. Our goal is 45. We don't even talk 60. So, but 92% of our patients, as you can see down here, receive it within 60 minutes. And out of those, 69 receive it within 45 minutes. That's something that we are held to, to be certified. Our door to puncture is what we're hoping Pulsera will help us with. Our average is 111 minutes. It needs to be 90 or less. This is the, the slide that I send out to Dr. Whitwer and Dr. Bell every month, and this shows uh, the stratification. The blue uh, lines are the stroke codes that you bring in to our emergency department. You think, you, you know, it's a possible stroke. The red line, you know, we have the two-step process, the, the stroke code, and then we have the 911 upgrade. That the red is uh, after they see the ED physician and they say, yes, we think it's a, a possible intervention. So then they, that's when they go into the emergent mode. And then the green are the uh, actual interventions. And as you can see, what's happening is that it's, the patient is stratified and that's exactly what we need to see. You are given the opportunity to the larger population, which is great. And then it's the docs that hone it down once I get in the ED. And this all has to happen in a rapid uh, amount of time. These are our outcomes for 2016. Uh, for IV TPA alone, 67% uh, went home from the hospital. 16% went to inpatient rehab, either at our house or, uh, legacy, or uh, Kaiser. And then 12% went to SNF. And most of that 12% that went to SNF went to build up their stamina so they could, could go to a rehab later. Uh, our thrombectomies, last year we did eight. So far this year we've done 17. So as you can tell, it's just really taken off. 31% uh, of them went home from the hospital, 19 to inpatient rehab, and 25 to SNF. And then the combo, um, uh, 41 percent home, 28 percent to rehab, and 17 to sniff. All right, and this is my last slide. I just want to know if you guys think that is effective marketing. You know, watch out for stroke, but then you can go to McDonald's and have that wonderful breakfast 24/7 now. If y'all have any questions, you can contact me. I'm always around most of the time in the ED. Um, thank you.
All right, everybody. For the next part, we're going to talk about um, Salmon Creek uh, Stroke Center, give you some of the data that we have up front. That will be done by Christy Item, our stroke coordinator, and then uh, follow that by a short talk uh, for posterior circulation stroke, uh, the identification in the field and in the hospital. So to begin with, Christy Item. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm not going to stand too close to that. I talk loud enough. You can probably hear me. Let me know well, if you can. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're also a um, advanced primary stroke center. Um, so one of two sites in your area. We do not have endovascular treatment. Um, so our primary goal is to identify um, our patients that need treatment, um, and then we start TPA, and then we have the ability to transfer those patients. So that's just looking at kind of our um, certification levels and award statuses for the last four years. Yeah, sorry, sure. We're, we're taping. This. Okay. And is this working? So we've had um, some changes over the last few years um, with our program um, at a system level as well as just a site level. Um, so we um, had hired um, Dr. Jeezy back in October of 2015, and he. Um, has oversight for the entire program for our whole system. Um, we um, started um, with a, a dedicated neuro hospitalist that does all of our admissions and manages all of our inpatients that was started in January of 2016. Um, I just transferred to the center um, in this, uh, this last February. And um, very um, exciting upcoming change is we have a new vascular neurologist that's going to start this summer um, that will um, be coming on board with us. Um, we right now have programs um, for all of our um, nursing staff, all of our um, inpatient staff, as well as our ED with ongoing education um, and outreach just for those programs. Um, we also um, offer, um, every couple of months, we offer case reviews um, that Dr. Jeezy does for us that we're looking at opportunities um, for improvement within um, our program. So this is just some data similar to what Louise had shown you for um, our program um, at Salmon Creek. So we um, had a pretty um, decent um, uptick in our volume for our stroke patients um, this last year. Uh, so just under 400 cases um, that had a diagnosis of stroke. Our stroke types are very indicative of kind of the national average. Our ischemic strokes are by far the largest volume. Um, bleeds kind of on the low end. Um, our arrival mode um, is, and how our pre-notification. So that's kind of an important one for us. So even though um, from 2015, and that one is still not the one that's working. Um, from 2015 to 2016, the arrival mode didn't change um, significantly. However, the pre-notification changed significantly for us. Um, and for that, um, that is a big deal for us. And I think some of it has been the education that you guys have had and, and realize how important that is um, for us to get the right um, stakeholders involved early on in the treatment of the patient. So I just want to thank everybody for that early notification. That's um, wonderful for us. Before you jump to the next slide, yeah. I just want to make the point that this this ratio of EMS versus private vehicle transport is about the reverse of what you see in, in most of the country. Um, and it, it relates to the way the triage protocol has been uh, as opposed to how it is now. So it's going to be your, your triage protocol now is based on the likelihood of a large vessel occlusion as opposed to a, a time limit you know, after two hours, after three hours, etc. Uh, and you'll see in the next slide some of our data showing the difference between uh, the response times for private vehicle versus EMS. It really helps to have EMS transport and pre notification as well. It also changes our treatment rate because of those, um, that population that's coming in by private vehicle. It's usually eight hour, six hours, eight hours, um, even longer before um, they come in, unfortunately. And sometimes they're the milder symptoms, and so people wait to see if they're going to get better. For that. Um, so our, um, this is our, all of our treatable patients within um, the last four and a half hours. So we do treat up to the four and a half hours if they meet that criteria. Um, so our treatment rate has, um, has 
significantly increased from last year to this year. Um, and part of it's because of the management of the program, um, um, kind of the more invested uh, program directors um, and site uh, leaderships. So we're gradually just trying to increase that um, treatment rate for our patients. Um, so this year we already have a pretty good start with that. Um, the target stroke, not necessarily important to you, those are just, they have to meet specific measures for us to report them. Our total is usually much greater than the, those target stroke populations. The during meal time is really the big issue here. Uh, and, you know, I think nationally, we all want to keep it below 45 minutes, so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, I, I think the push, the next push is going to be for 30 minutes. Um, and it is true, I think we can all say, if we get free notification from you, we can give to our, we can give to our 20 minutes in many cases. So these are our um, treatment times um, for our door to needles uh, from last year um, up to current. Um, comparative from EMS um, on the top versus whether they came in um, private vehicle. Um, so you can see there's a pretty substantial difference. Now we've got a few of our outliers. Um, any of the uh, ones, the 54 minutes and, above, and um, below, were all patients that we had pre-notification um, from EMS. So those were the ones that we did our quick pit stop. They stayed on the EMS gurney. They will go direct to CT, um, and then we can initiate treatment very quickly. So all of our, like I said, all, at 54 and below, were all pre-notification. Our couple outliers that we had that were above 60 minutes, those were ones that had waxing and waning symptoms, so the decision wasn't made up front. Um, kind of the same thing, our 75 and our 87 were also, the, the stroke was evolving, so the decision was made after it continued to evolve. Um, but it's just, that's just very important to know that we can almost half our time when we have that pre-notification. This is just um, a graphical depiction of the um, data on a TPA, on a standard TPA case that I mine the data, um, and I'm gonna communicate that to all of our stakeholders within the hospital. So this was a case that came in by EMS. Uh, we got pre-notification. Um, the patient had been complaining that he wasn't feeling well, was at um, the in-laws, told his wife, hey, I wanna go home. She said, not right now. She hadn't seen him for about an hour and a half, went and found him kind of rolling around on the floor, garbled speech, um, and um, complete hemiplegia. Um, called 911, they did the stroke alert, got the patient there. Our top times here are our goal times. As you can see, um, we were well under um, our goal times for getting those um, that patient treated. This patient actually had a door to TPA time of 35 minutes, um, largely in part because we had that pre-notification and we had everybody involved uh, by the time the patient hit the door. The patient <coughs> had a fantastic outcome, got TPA, symptoms resolved with in 24 hours, went home with no deficits. So what we're looking forward to, so I know you guys are looking at uh, Pulsara from Southwest. Um, we won't be uh, implementing that at this point um, at Salmon Creek. However, our Cascade Stroke Coordinators, which Louise is part of, um, Last, last month, month before, uh, we had our meeting and discussed looking at a feedback tool that we could use um, in the whole area. Um, so every site that um, EMS would bring a patient to would use a standardized tool um, to get that information out to you guys. Because we really want to give that feedback. You guys can see the outcomes and see how important um, that information is to you. So we're looking at that standardized tool right now. This is what the, um, the current version uh, looks like. So this is an endovascular case um, where we've embedded some endovascular images, um, but if they were just a, a TPA case, then it could be just a CT that would be on there um, and not the angiogram. Um, but then it gives you some door times, um, whether or not we met those goal times, and then the outcome of the patient. So we're just looking for feedback of what everybody wants, what all sites would utilize, and then your medical director then would disseminate that information, and so you're not gonna have to piecemeal through six different types of um, case reviews to figure out what everybody's looking for. We're trying to really look at something that would be the same across all systems. And that's all I have, so now Dr. Jeezy's gonna talk a little bit about posterior circulation. Thank you very much. So I wanted to talk to you about the identification of posterior circulation strokes 
As you uh, heard earlier, the majority of strokes are in the anterior circulation, the middle cerebral artery, MCA there, about 60%. Uh, but there are 15 to 20% that are going to be in the posterior circulation. And we really don't want to miss these patients uh, along the, the it, 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 pointing out the significance of this. You're seeing lots of slides that look like this, right? You've shown us slides that look like this. We just showed you a slide that looked like this. And we're looking fundamentally here at the, at the anterior circulation. We're interested in the middle cerebral artery. We're pulling clots out of there. Uh, but in fact, there's a lot more going on than just the anterior circulation. If we look at the brain from underneath, what we're seeing is this really extensive posterior circulation with vertebral arteries where the posterior cerebellar artery comes off, the basilar artery without which you cannot survive, um, and the uh, anterior inferior uh, cerebellar artery and the superior cerebellar artery all come out, off here. And I want to emphasize these over the next uh, 30 minutes. Um, there is also the anterior cerebral artery, I will point out, not to neglect any particular artery, but it occurs in only about 2% of the stroke, so we don't focus on that a great deal. The middle cerebral artery territory, uh, Louise has already described the typical symptoms of hemiparesis, sensory loss, visual field loss, gaze deviation, with or without aphasia. And these are the symptoms that we've all become very good at identifying using a variety of field tools. In the posterior circulation, we tend to have symptoms restricted to vision. Not entirely, but the vast majority of them are restricted to vision. So what you lose is the visual field on one side of the body. So right eye, right field, left eye, right field. Both of those would be the same in, that, in a single patient. Occasionally, because the basilar supplies both posterior cerebrals, you get a bilateral hemianopia, i.e. blindness. But interestingly, these patients acutely seem to not know that they are blind, so they will deny it. So you say, how many fingers are holding up? They say, three. They just make up numbers. And you may just think that they're confused, and in fact, it's a neglect phenomenon. Uh, so fascinating, but makes it all that much more difficult to identify the stroke. The basilar artery cases, I said without it, you really can't survive. If it is just a perforator, a small vessel coming off of the basilar, you may have uh, less severe symptoms, so you might see a facial palsy that looks like a Bell's palsy, lower motor neuron, upper face and lower face are both involved. It mimics a Bell's palsy. You may see misalignment of the eyes, either from a cranial nerve problem, third, fourth, or sixth nerve, or something called an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, which is entertaining, but only neurologists seem to find it fun. Um, you can see gaze palsies that look similar to what you see in the middle cerebral artery territory. Um, one and a half syndrome, I won't go into that, but that's another neurology uh, fun point. Uh, and then severe dysarthria, so that the speech may be almost incomprehensible. They're not aphasic, but it's hard to understand them because they're slurring so badly. The larger basal artery occlusions give you the, what I consider the fate worse than death, which is the locked-in syndrome. You cannot move any of your extremities. You cannot move your face. The only thing you can move is your eyelids, and you can look up and down. And there have been horrifying cases in the literature of patients who have been presumed to be in coma for years and who are discovered to be locked in. So they've been awake for years, and simply we didn't know it until they were examined thoroughly. Um, so obviously we want to identify all of these. With, with the use of CT angiography in this era, we're not missing these cases uh, very often. Another posterior circulation uh, syndrome with the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. It comes off the vertebral artery in that diagram I showed you before, and it gives you an interesting syndrome. Ipsilateral facial sensory loss, contralateral sensory loss in the body. So this is one of the cross syndromes you described before. And ipsilateral ataxia, clumsiness, nystagmus, which is not part of most of our scales or any of our scales, 
hoarseness of the voice and a Horner syndrome, which has to do with the pupil and the lids. So it's, it's a very interesting but very common posterior circulation syndrome. There are others, and I did this not exactly as a joke, but to sort of tease you, um, ocular motor palsy with contralateral ataxia. So you, one eye is not moving and you, you're clumsy on the opposite side of the body. Dejerin syndrome, tongue weakness, contralateral hemiparesis and hemisensory. Foveal syndrome, gaze palsy here, contralateral hemiparesis. So it goes on and on. But what is the common theme here? Well, exactly as Louise had said, it's about crossed syndromes. So it may be motor on one side, sensory on the other. It may be sensory face on one side and body on the other. It may be ocular motor on one side and weakness on the other. Um, the other common thing in the posterior circulation is that patients frequently present with vertigo. A real challenge for us in the emergency room is it an inner ear problem or is it a stroke? We really want to assess these patients carefully to figure it out. We'd rather have them come in very quickly via ambulance so we can sort it out in case they are strokes. Ataxia, clumsiness, is a common manifestation of posterior circulation. And one of the only things that really shows up on our scales, the NIH stroke scale, um, and then rarely the quadriparesis, uh, for instance, the patient who's locked in. So identification of these syndromes generally requires examination of the eye movements in addition to the elements of the NIH stroke scale, which I'll talk about again very briefly. Um, and I'll but point out that even the NIH stroke scale does not ag address the question of crossed symptoms. So briefly, give me a minute or two with this. The NIH stroke scale, we start out with how alert is the patient, that's 1A. Next we say, what month is it? How old are you? So we just get a brief sense of orientation. We say make a fist with your hand, open it, close your eyes, and open them. So can they follow commands? That's an aphasia as well as orientation issue. We ask them to look all the way to the right and all the way to the left. And if the eyes are misaligned, it's true they do get a point for misalignment, but we're not saying, ooh, that's a cranial nerve finding, that's posterior circulation. We're just saying the eyes aren't moving very well. There's one point on the NIH stroke scale. We check visual fields. Can you see on this side? Can you see on that side? We check each of the quadrants. And that does help us identify a posterior cerebral artery stroke. But it doesn't really distinguish between a middle cerebral artery stroke, which may get the visual fibers, and a posterior cerebral stroke, which gets the neurons. They look pretty much the same. So you can't distinguish anterior from posterior. We look for facial palsy. And it's true, if they have a what looks like a Bell's palsy, we give them an extra point compared to if it's just lower face, uh, but it doesn't jump out at you as posterior circulation when you're just giving a total score. Motor arm and leg, not surprising. We do look at ataxia. You can get up to two points for ataxia. We check sensation, but we just say whether it's present, reduced, or absent. And it you would not know if it was a crossed sensory sim syndrome. Language gets a lot of points for aphasia. Dysarthria doesn't really distinguish anterior from posterior. And then the extinction or hemineglect is an anterior circulation syndrome. So to give you the flavor of what we're looking for with the NIH stroke scale, this is a preview to the scales you're doing in the field, middle cerebral artery, most of these elements are all attributable to the middle cerebral artery. and I don't blame them. 60% of the strokes are occurring in the middle cerebral artery, but that still leaves us posterior circulation fans uh, out of luck. The posterior cerebral artery, for the most part, it's just vision that's affected. Occasionally, the territory is so large, an anatomical variant, that it does involve sensation or strength, but that is unusual. Vertebra basilar. Well, level of consciousness, if you have a, a locked-in type patient, gaze is affected, ataxia is good, and dysarthria. So there are some elements if it's the vertebra basilar. Um, but when you talk about these syndromes that I gave you before, the ICA territory, the only thing we'll see is ataxia. So you'll get mo at most one or two points, at which point many treating physicians would say, oh, that's not really much. Maybe we won't give TPA. 
we're pushing against that. <laughs> Hopefully that's not the case anymore, but historically that has been the case. The superior cerebellar, only ataxia. The posterior, inferior cerebellar, ataxia, and maybe dysarthria. It's really hoarseness of the voice. So hopefully I've made my point here that the NIH stroke scale really does not look at the posterior circulation well. Well, what does this do to us? Well, it results in a lot of delays. So this is a 2017 study looking at 71,000 stroke patients over a 12-year period in which nearly 12,000 of them were posterior circulation. And the median time to presentation, meaning were the patients aware, did they call 911, did they come in uh, by a private vehicle, was an average of an hour later, for starters. And then half the frequency of treatment with TPA compared to, posterior, compared to anterior circulation. Um, and their, their median NIH was lower, <coughs> not surprisingly, but not that much lower. So we were just, I think, failing to recognize them as strokes quickly, as quickly as we should. When we did recognize it, the average was 13 minutes longer, and that's a lot of brain cells being lost in that 13 minutes. So it is impairing our the patient's recognition and our recognition. When we look at uh, factors overall affecting the accuracy of a pre-hospital stroke diagnosis, so you've called a stroke code, is it a stroke or not, or you haven't called a st stroke uh, code and was it simply missed, um, they looked at the elements that were significantly associated with missing them. You see, here's the statistic. In this particular population, 62% uh, correctly identified, 38% missed. That's most of the world, those are our statistics. Most commonly missed were bilateral weakness, sometimes thought of as diffuse weakness. Well, what do we see in basilar artery? Bilateral weakness. Uh, dizziness, well, again, we said we see dizzy vertigo in the majority of the posterior circulation. And then headache, which is a pretty nonspecific symptom, so not a posterior circulation issue per se. In the ED, so this is now being missed by us, either the ED physician or the neurologist, um, the cases that are missed. So there was a substantial number of strokes initially missed, not called a stroke, but ultimately seen a stroke during their hospitalization. The significant association, again, dizziness, nausea, vomiting. We think it's GI, we think it's inner ear. It turns out it's actually, in, the most, in most cases, poster, posterior circulation. Um, Gaze preference, which is a, can be an anterior circulation symptom, as we said before, was not missed. That actually helped. So what are our, our stroke screening tools? There's a, a whole bunch of them. You're familiar, obviously, with at least one of them, but probably several of them. Um, all of these involve facial droop, arm weakness, and speech difficulty, the FAS of FAST, right? Um, and uh, only two, one of which is new, the BFAST, include vision. So FAST is face, arm, and speech. BFAST involves the addition of balance or coordination and eye problems. And that can be either vision loss, typically monocular, the way it's written at least, or misalignment of the eyes, diplopia. Um, so that's starting to bring in posterior circulation. But for the most part, it's not in any of the scales that we are using. Well, the next issue now with a two-tiered approach to stroke identification is to look at large vessel occlusion or the probability of a large vessel occlusion. So we need to look at those scales as well. So the fast ED is face, arm, speech. You add in eye deviation and neglect, not particularly posterior circulation oriented, right? It's, it's more about a large MCA stroke that's going to give you a gaze preference and a, a, a hemineglect syndrome, uh, positive requiring greater than or equal to four. Well, think about, think about a patient with a, uh, a, you know, a vertebral artery occlusion. They're going to have some nystagmus. They'll have some vertigo. Uh, but they're not going to have any of these problems. They might have face, and it's not going to be enough to rise to the significant level of a positive FAST ED score. The CSTAT, which is what we're using in the Portland metro area on the other side of the river, just uh, looks at scoring gaze, arm, and level of consciousness. Well, 
They could have a locked-in <laughs> syndrome from basal artery occlusion. They'd still only get one point. So we're going to miss the posterior circulation cases, unfortunately, if that's all we rely upon. The race score, face, arm, leg, gaze deviation. Again, if it's posterior circulation and gaze deviation, you're going to get three points. It's not going to be positive. The LAPSS, which I believe is what you're using here, face, arm, and grip not oriented to the posterior circulation. So how can we improve our sensitivity to posterior circulation stroke? Well, test the visual fields is, is one option because you're going to get that with the posterior cerebral artery. All right, it's, a, it's cortex, but it's coming from the posterior circulation. Specifically ask about balance, but also test coordination. And that should be a, a real red flag uh, as in part of the BFAST protocol. Look for disconjugate gaze. So if you say, okay, look all the way to the left, look all the way to the right. If one eye comes over and the other one doesn't, it's disconjugate. And that is a posterior circulation syndrome, not an anterior circulation syndrome. Um, and then looking for nystagmus. Maybe not your favorite activity, but if the eyes are uh, you're jerking back and forth and they jerk heavily in one direction and it slows down in the other direction. That's typical of vestibular nystagmus. It could be posterior circulation. It could be inner ear. But it's a very important clue. And that would really highlight our awareness or our suspicion, excuse me, for the possibility of a posterior fossa stroke. So that's all I have to say about it. Those are the references if you like looking up articles. Question. Yeah, so the question is about a pupillary asymmetry in the stroke patient. So um, typically not involved a great deal in that, that, that Wallenberg or lateral medullary syndrome. I said there was a Horner syndrome, and that's a really subtle difference. But the big blown pupil is more of uh, something you're going to see with a herniation syndrome or a, an intracerebral hemorrhage. So it is really important and presumably something that you would say, I got a patient with a blown pupil, we'll all run around like our hair's on fire, and we'll be ready for you, but we're thinking more about hemorrhagic stroke than ischemic stroke. Yes? Well, the one slide you showed that uh, 100 and some cases were missed out of the 400, so that's 25 percent of those cases. Clearly, if nausea and vomiting, vertigo, you're looking for a medical. Mm -hmm. Well, so, um, so what that has prompted us to do is to do the full NIH stroke scale on every patient that's coming in with a neurologic deficit so that we have a greater probability of identifying those cases and also just alerted our sensitivity to the balance mm -hmm. and vertigo aspect uh, of, of the screening tool. So we really like the be fast screening tool much more than the fast tool at this point. Yes. And vertigo, do they have to be associated with a headache? No. 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 They're, they're, they're independent of one another. They, it may be associated with headache, but just vertigo alone. Now, it, it plagues us in the emergency room, both ED physicians and neurologists, because a large proportion of these, probably 75 percent of these patients are, in fact, just vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis, but it, it's incumbent on us to distinguish the central causes from the peripheral causes and find those strokes as quickly Maybe as we can. It's pretty rapid onset, though. It's not like I've been ill for a couple of days and now I have vertical. It's, I'm fine and now all of a sudden, just a moment, I have vertical. But unfortunately, that's the way that the uh, vestibular neuritis yeah. risks. It does, too, yeah. Like yeah. yeah. Yes? Would, if vertigo, would, it, would turning the head like labyrinthitis or anything, if it's a stroke, would it change or would it be the same? They're going to behave pretty much similarly. So if, if it's vestibular nystagmus, it's going to change with head position. But vestibular applies both to brainstem strokes and to um, inner ear problems. So that alone is not going to be a distinguishing feature. This, the screening tool that we use in the ED, the HINTS uh, technique, is to look at the, the effect of head thrusts to see whether the vestibulo-ocular reflex appears to be intact. If it's peripheral, it should not be intact. 
We then look to see if the nystagmus looks vestibular, meaning it's always in the same direction depending, irrespective of where they're looking. And then third, we look for a vertical deviation of the eyes, a test of skew. And if any of those is, is suspicious, then we treat it as if it's a stroke. We re-scan them and investigate from there. So, Dr. Giese, what's, what's a good pre-hospital test for balance coordination, something that we're typically not doing now? I, I would say finger, finger to nose, finger to nose ataxia. So if it's wobbling side to side, it's ataxia. If, if they're weak and they have trouble getting the arm up there, that's not ataxia. But that wobble should really alert us. Uh, uh, well, I'm not, I don't necessarily know what you mean by medical. So certainly if it's vestibular neuritis, which to me is a medical issue, they're going to have the same nystagmus. It's not going to help you distinguish. But for the patient who says, I'm dizzy, and you say, well, you're spinning. No, I'm dizzy. Well, I don't know what dizzy means. But if they, if they just say they're dizzy nonspecifically and they do not have nystagmus, that makes stroke much less likely. Even, even alcohol, uh, you know, dilantin, <coughs> anything, you get nystagmus. It may and may not be associated with. The point is, if you have a patient who's complaining of vertigo, spinning dizziness, we want you to think, this is maybe a posterior stroke. Let us sort it out in the ED, let the neurologist sort it out, because if you miss it, it's a big deal. You don't have to become junior neurologist in the field. We haven't got to that pay grade yet. But you also don't want us you know, pushing the stroke button every time somebody's got an osteoblast. No, but once again, I'd rather, you see what we've got going on, I'd rather have you Overcall than undercall. We're willing to accept 25 to 30 percent overcall. We would too. We'd rather you bring them in and let us discern it out. Arrow and side of the patient. Yes. So we use the FAST to determine whether the patient's initial <coughs> experience. The LAMS is used to, for destination. Well, I, 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 I think if you went through the trouble to identify the other elements, like the, the, the visual symptoms, the E for BE fast, um, or the balance and ataxia issues, I would treat that as a likely stroke and transport it as a stroke code. That's not a large vessel occlusion symptom per se, that's just a stroke symptom. But uh, I'll leave it to you whether yeah. it's official or not. Yeah, no, we're, the, we, we, we change our orders um, twice a year at the most. Uh, and we're going to be doing an upgrade, update of stroke orders in July, August. Uh, and we will probably go to, the, we'll probably do an educational thing and do a, and go to the B fast so that we get the posterior st strokes. And we'll be way ahead of the curve in, in Washington then. And then in the long run, we're the destiny, probably, and, and we're in entire agreement, probably the destination for the hospital, uh, of the hospital should be entirely driven by whether you think this is a large vessel stroke or not, because that's the difference. And the BFAST covers it. The BFAST will pull out some of your posterior yeah. it's, so stroke it's a element. It's for stroke, and yeah. it'll, it'll help improve your sensitivity, yeah. but still you would base your, your destination on the large vessel yeah. occlusion scale, because that is going to be the most reliable test. Right. Then we can do a B right score. Too. <laughs> <laughs> How come we're not pre-hospital using DVT more often as a clinical 
clinical site. They, they, they do it almost immediately at the hospitals. Using? Um, we don't have it because it's expensive. Well, they used to be, you know, and and uh, we've not added that to, a, you know, an interesting question. So, okay, uh, we have. Uh, if there's no other questions, we I have uh, case reviews coming up. Uh, I know that. Uh, uh, and, and some of them are stroke cases, but we'll, we can go over that. And uh, I know I, I offered you guys could stay as long as you want, but I'm sure you have work to do, neurology to do. Um, thank you for having us. I'd like to thank our speakers today. Okay, well then we'll start right off with case reviews. Is this one? Yep, that one's working too. Okay, a couple of things uh, that relate to stroke. Um, uh, the Washington State Key Performance Indicators, KPIs, these are, um, these were decided on by the state medical directors and the state EMS uh, uh, committee uh, for stroke TIA patient management these are elements that we expect to be in the chart that we can then these are data elements that come out and if and when WEMSIS 3 gets fully fledged we'll be able to do some uh, analysis some some initial analysis of uh, stroke treatment or cardiac treatment pre-hospital uh, sort of automatically by, uh, by using data. Um, and the key elements that are in there right now for the Washington State uh, KPIs are pres the percent of suspected CVATIA patients with a FAST exam, any neuro screening exam, and we've added now the LAM score to that, and I guess we'll add the BFAS, so any of those scores used, uh, or a documentation of why you couldn't perform the exam. You know, there's, you can't do a LAMS, there's no point in doing a LAMS if the patient's totally paralyzed except being able to move their eyes, their eyelids, you can't really do a LAM score on that patient. Um, the percent of suspected CVA TIA patients who received a blood glucose check, percent of patients with an EMS scene time arrival to departure of less than 20 minutes. Now, you may say, wait a minute, you've got 15 in your, we've got 15 in our orders, yes, but the state said that 20 was going to be their number. Percent of suspected CVA TI patients was the time last normal, less than six hours to hospital arrival. We're now looking at eight hours. Percent of patients transported to a designated stroke receiving center. So when you look at our data, and this is what we can call out so far of our total strokes last year. Uh, almost, uh, almost, uh, oh, I mean, almost 1,132 of them. Uh, 1,001 1, had a fast and or LAM score done. So that's 85 percent. Now remember, just, just to, I'm not going to interrupt yep. you, although I am, um, yep. <laughs> is that that means it was either, this doesn't mean whether or not the LAMs or fast score was done, it's whether it was documented. documented. So we can't We're tell pulling this out of our database. Yeah, unless it gets documented. If you don't so write it key. down, it wasn't done. That's why it's nice to have, uh, when, we get to, when we get to tablets, when we get to doing uh, the, your electronic medical record right at the time, you'll be able to touch the button that says fast score or whatever. 
Uh, blood glucose performed well, 94 percent. That's very so. 94 percent were either performed and documented. Now, I know you guys are going to tell me I do a blood glucose on every stroke patient. Well, you miss didn't write it down on six of them. Six percent. Yeah. Now that's and that's important. That's a good thing to note because. What about the ones you didn't call in as a, I can't find those yet. I can't find those yet. Because you're not going to write down, oh, I should have called this a stroke, if you didn't know it was a stroke. So how about those posterior ones that got to the hospital and didn't get sorted out? So just to, just to mention an important point about that, and that's a great question, is that of those 1,132 patients, those were patients where you guys documented stroke as primary or secondary assessment. Mm -hmm. So for strokes where you died, you're, where, where it was documented as headache or nausea, vomiting or altered mental status, those don't get picked up. So if you suspect a stroke, and for every, well, pretty much everybody has an electronic documentation format now, it's really important that you put stroke in there so we can gather that data. Right. So we can tell you whether or not you're doing a good job. Yeah. And then scene, scene time of less than 20 minutes, 64%. Uh, so the, the, the logic of that is that maybe that scene time, I mean, scene, scene time is scene time. I know it takes longer to do things, although, although Portland has a 10 minute on scene time for tra major traumas, they don't bother following it because they know they don't make it. So, okay, first case. 40-year-old uh, male supine on kitchen floor, no acute distress, mild lumbar back pain and head pain after having a seizure, falling on the floor, past history of seizures related to previous TBI. Family reports patient had a seizure today about 20 minutes, lasting about a minute, followed by unusually short postictal period. For him, usually he, it was only a minute, roughly. Um, patient fell during the seizure, hit his head on the counter. Reports he had a left-sided facial droop, slurred speech. Administered a dose of uh, they gave him sublingual Ativan after his first seizure. GCS is 14, which is his baseline. Um, everything looked okay except the hematoma on his forehead. He had dry blood in both nares. Uh, nose was swollen. It smacked his face. Um, otherwise appeared to be okay, moved all four normally in normal sensation. Blood pressure, et cetera, wasn't unusual. Fire, uh, first response was holding uh, manual C spines. He put them on a C collar, put them on a long backboard. Moved to the ambulance. Began code one two legacy per family request. Okay, what's wrong with that? Family request, known seizure. Why do you have him in see up spine precautions on a long backboard? Because he smacked his face, and you're trying to rule out this is going to be a trauma. Except happily. He has now a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, lasting about a minute, got some Versed. And after a brief postictal period, he's not moving his left side. Remember, the family said he didn't seem to be moving quite as well after the first seizure. Let's see. Oop. Uh, family reports the left-sided facial droop and slurred speech after the first seizure, but then it went away. It was okay by the time he got there. So now he has this generalized tonic-clonic seizure and he's not moving his left side. Left facial droop, flaccid left arm, left leg, upgraded code three and went to P-South for possible stroke intracranial bleed. Vitals still seem to be, seem to be okay. Uh, if he had intracranial bleed, I would have expected to see his blood pressure and heart rate to be a little different than that if they had significant intracranial uh, hypertension. <clears throat> so, their assessment, 
roulette stroke, IC bleed versus Todd's paralysis. Well, it turns out that this was Todd's paralysis. Good old Todd. Uh, <coughs> which is a brief period by brief. I've seen it reported up to seven days after a seizure. Most of the time it's within the first several hours. Paralysis, which may be partial or complete, occurs. It's the transient paralysis after a seizure. This guy had never had one reported before, apparently. Usually subsides completely. But of course, it can be confused then as a stroke. So he did indeed have it. It cleared in the ED, and he has his labs and his CT was normal, and he went home with family. By the way, his uh, C-spine uh, uh, CT was also normal. So it was a good job. So he really needed to see spine control, but he needed to go first to a trauma center to get that work up. But after he had the seizure, or after he had the paralysis, that was appropriate. Code two, number cage, case two. Patients in the shower with the fire department trying to extricate him. Uh, patient's wife related she left the house about 11. Patient was normal when she returned home and heard him in the shower when he didn't get out and went to check on him. Found him on the ground in the shower with slurred speech, which led to the 911 call. Initially, they, no one, they, you couldn't tell whether he fell or however he got on the, on the floor of the, of the uh, shower. So he was put in modified C-spine after further questioning, if there was any trauma, it was, he just sort of slumped. He was showering, began to have trouble, which led him to collapse, didn't hit his head, had no loss of consciousness, denied any pain. His only complaint was weakness on the left side. Had no change in condition during transport, went to Southwest. Um, so at 1650, he had, now remember, it was at 11 o'clock that he was last seen as normal, right? So this is now 16, um, 16, well, I get, get the right case or I'm in better shape. Okay, it's 16, uh, 1650 has stroke scale. Doesn't put down what his stroke scale was on this. Um, facility activated at 1700, so now we're, we're uh, six hours post event before he even gets there. Blood glucose was 134. Um, so we're following our times here. This is the patient time tracker from uh, Peace Health. So uh, uh, at time zero, uh, ED providers at the bedside at that point. Uh, he was upgraded to Neuro 911 immediately in a minute. Um, CT, CT was ordered uh, or was gotten five minutes after he got there. CTA result. Uh, CTA, uh, CT results in 34 minutes, CTA results in 34 minutes, he had a CTA at the same time. Um, and then we've got door to time, uh, a, d a decision to groin uh, a minute 41, an hour 41, excuse me, uh, which is a little bit longer. Your goal is 90, our goal internally is 90 minutes. Um, took a little bit longer than that. Now, uh, he had an occlusion of his right M2 branch of the middle cerebral artery, 
thrombectomy was done, 80% of the organized clot was removed with solitaire devices. He had some residual emboli in the distal branches of the parietal lobe, which you couldn't, you can't get to. Uh, he denied headache, visual motor sensory. Uh, uh, he had a slight residual left weakness. This is the next day. Uh, they thought possibly He'd, uh, he'd had some head trauma while skiing, uh, which was being evaluated uh, as, as maybe a reason for developing a clot. Um, uh, he, was then, he was then transferred to Six Tower, uh, ambulating, eating normally, uh, a little bit of overall weakness of his left face and sensory uh, uh, loss. Uh, but home to outpatient therapy uh, on the fourth day and, is, and was doing well and continued outpatient therapy and did well. Now, he went immediately to thrombectomy without TPA because he was out of the TPA window. She didn't come home and discover him for, you know, he was at six hours at that point. So, case three. Patient complains of not being able to get his words out starting at 6.15. See, he'd been up several hours at that point. He's 72 years old, uh, had no other complaints. All vitals are stable. Code 3, without incident. Um, so here's our times. This is at 6.51, uh, stroke alert is called to the hospital. Um, his GCS is about 13. Patient time tracker on this one, time zero, he gets his CT uh, ordered in seven minutes of arrival. He was a 911 up, upgrade immediately. Um, CT results are out in 21 minutes. CTA results are out in 46 minutes. Um, IV TPA was given uh, an hour, 60, 66 minutes or so. Uh, So he had a delay in going to, in getting his TPA because he had the, this was the waxing and waning symptoms. He started with aphasia and dysarthria, it got better. He ended up with a, uh, either an occlusion versus a very tight stenosis, left middle cerebral artery. Um, been, he got up in the ED, went to the commode without problem. Then he had slight, and then his slight facial droop was gone. And then after, uh, and then uh, after the TPA monitoring, he was totally deficit free in 24 hours. So his door to needle was prolonged to 76 minutes. Rather, we'd like to see it under under 60 and certainly under 45 would be even better, but because he had fluctuating symptoms. And those are the hard ones to sort out because how do you sort out when somebody has a symptom and shows up and then all of his symptoms go away, you say, well, this is probably a TIA. And then they come back. So this is kind of a red flag where we have to kind of watch these guys really closely. Case four. This is an old, this is an older, quite an older gentleman. The son and his mother were at home with the patient, patient eating food when he went limp. Suddenly unable to talk to them, making no attempt to talk or even move his arms or leg. Then he vomited twice. Now they related that he has dementia, but his normal baseline is some confusion, but he's al always able to talk, converse, is self-ambulatory, and takes care of himself, except he doesn't do his own cooking and stuff. Patient had no physical complaints, but was up most of the night, which was unusual. So he's sitting in a recliner, 
awake breathing, GCS of nine, right, notable right sided facial droop with drooling, emesis on his shirt, fixed gaze to the left. So now we're starting to get some, some uh, posterior kind of things as well as maybe big middle cerebral artery. Unable to move right arms or leg or legs, he has right legs, um, and made minimal movement with left arm and hand, moved to gurney. Uh, he, gave, he got an antiemetic, went to CT immediately on a gurney, and so once again he goes to, it, he is, uh, stroke, stroke team is immediately done, his time zero, he, go, he gets a neuro upgrade, um, Shortly after arrival, about 14 minutes, but he's 2 CT. Uh, he gets an IV TPA bolus at by 31 minutes into this. Um, decision to go to the to the cath lab. Door to groin is 2:43. Now that's a long time. Got his IV TPA, but he's not getting better. You say, well, why are we making, taking so long to make a decision to take it? Well, the reason is he's 90 years old. <laughs> he was still mute with right hemiparesis. The family was interested in a thrombectomy. Now, this is, the, this is from the the neurointerventionist. I did tell them that in general, patients who are greater than 80 don't do well, and it's not FDA approved for acute ischemic stroke in this population. They were quite adamant that the patient is very healthy at baseline, and they would be open to any potential intervention. CTA ordered. It shows a large vessel occlusion, and they will do a catheter-based approach. And they took him to the cath lab. Um, a four by four solitaire, single pass, retrieved an organized clot. They had TCI three flow restored and went back to the ICU. A day later, he's got mild right hemiparesis, little, little loss of visual fields, dysphagia. He was ultimately discharged to a sniff. He was still not swallowing regularly, but being retrain for swallow and it was anticipated that he would be going from the sniff return home uh, with his family now, 90 years old you say not quite as good as the old guy who fell off his bicycle recently with his stroke he was 94 and he did he did much better but he was in better shape to start with although people might argue as they do with me that anyone who rides your bicycle when you're beyond a certain age is probably demented anyway. Okay. Husband woke up, found patient laying on the floor, unable to uh, uh, get up, has slurred speech. Um, patient says she got up at four, was fine, but couldn't exactly uh, determine when she had these symptoms. She complained of left-sided weakness, left arm was flaccid slurred speech and left sided facial droop. So she's got a large vessel occlusion. Lamb score was five. So uh, blood glucose was 131. She gets stroke alert. Uh, she gets a 911 upgrade within three minutes of arrival. Um, neuro provider is there in the neurologist is there in 22 minutes. CTA uh, res CT results uh, by 40 by uh, 49 minutes into the CTA results, uh, an hour and uh, 69 minutes. <coughs> she uh, she ended up going. She got her her. Um, um, She didn't get TPA because we didn't know the onset of symptoms. So she went right to the cath lab. 
So control, she had elevated blood pressure. She had her blood pressure controlled with labetalol and nicardipin. It's unusual, so she had quite out of, she had quite a bit of uh, uh, hypertension. Um, she had a complete reopening of, of her uh, middle cerebral, right middle cerebral artery. Um, and did well. Uh, this was clear. The entire hemisphere was cleared. She was uh, went to Manor Care for uh, care of her. She had a uh, an ulcer on a foot, um, so she needed an onset of new atrial fibrillation. Um, so she needed to be treated for that as well. So she's on Lovenox and Coumadin bridging. This is interesting after having just had TPA to go on to another anti, uh, anti thrombolytic or anti platelet drug. Okay, now we're going to switch gears. Last case, but it's an important case. Code three for urgent transport from. Urgent clinic at Memorial to Peace Health. Upon arrival, find a 27-year-old male in, <laughs> in SVT with dizziness and chest tightness. Move to Gurney, transported code three. Pulse was one, was 240. Blood pressure 115 over 80. 12 lead was read as supraventricular tachycardia, non-STEMI, got adenosine 6 milligrams IV unchanged, got adenosine 12 milligrams IV unchanged, arrived at, medicals, at uh, medical center and was tra and transferred care. What is this? the patient, well, it wouldn't help, as a matter of fact, confuse the thing, is that uh, in, the, in the interview of the patient and the discussion with the uh, with, uh, urgent clinic, uh, the patient has said that somebody, a cardiologist had once told him that he might have WPW, but They've done, they, they've done some evaluation and then said he didn't have it. That's just a, a, a red herring here and it's confusional. What's the treatment of this? What's the treatment of atrial fibrillation with wide complex with rapid ventricular response? Is adenosine the treatment? Well, this guy was so stable, he seemed to be nice. 
I think I'd like treating with something. I want to treat the treating valve. If you're going to use any drug at all, you might use amiodarone. But why not just call them unsafe? Now, what's the problem if you treat atrial fibrillation with wide complex <coughs> with any of these things, like adenosine or any of the AV blocking those like parathenol or secondary pathways. That's yeah, right. What you do is you block the AV node and the only thing open is that bad pathway, which becomes ventricular tachycardia and or ventricular fibrillation, which may not allow a normal thing to re-enter when you don't get out of the fibrillation attack. <coughs> so it's potentially lethal. Which what is what? Which is what? What did Memorial call it? Who cares? We're not I'm not I'm not talking to Memorial. They said he's got a rapid heart rate. They probably said it's supraventricular. And definitely, it is definitely supraventricular. I'm not arguing that. It's supraventricular. It's, it's AFib, supraventricular. It's just not, you know, your adenosine. OK, this is the conversion. This is after conversion. And by the way, if you look real close at it, you can probably f you can see some delta waves in there. This is probably a WPW, so whoever you saw before didn't really do much of a workup. So, wide complex tachycardia that is thought to be supraventricular, you could use aden adenocard on a wide complex tachycardia if it's stable, regular, and monomorphic. That is neither stable, regular, nor monomorphic. You've got all sorts of different looking QRSs in there. You've got irregular, so it automatically fails the adenosine test. Wide complex tachycardia, the supraventricular tachycardia, that's really fast, narrow complex, that's when you use diltiazem or verapamil or adenosine. Atrial fibrillation, narrow complex, you can use diltiazem or verapamil. Wide complex, do not use those things that have. I mean, even as simple, if you had atrial fibrillation, wide complex tachycardia, and you ask the guy to do a Valsalva maneuver, that is relatively contraindicated because of the AV node blocking. It's not so bad because it won't, after he passes out from his V-fib, <coughs> V-tac, he won't still have AV node stimulation. <laughs> okay. So, look at your, you, you, before you treat any dysrhythm, you have to diagnose the dys, dysrhythmia. And atrial fibrillation just pops out at you. And atrial fibrillation, you treat differently. Okay, next month is skills month. Next month is skills month. <laughs> you don't have to come here. <laughs> it's very exciting. But thank you for coming here.